be ready for this good jump. Good morning, guys. <laughs> we are not talking about temptation today. <clears throat> <clears throat> but you're looking at a man who is really struggling right now with temptation. You are. I am so tempted to pull this back and release it into the ceiling. Now, I am also a man who haven't I, like, I honestly haven't thought through all the consequences of that. And part of me thinks, hey, this is the time to do it if ever, because Rob's gone. But if I'm honest, I think if Rob were here, he'd be probably the loudest voice encouraging me to do it. All right, because Rob and I know that, hey, that's Doug's job to figure out how to get it down. <clears throat> the truth is, I think the temptation is, if I were to... Uh, stick this arrow into the ceiling, I think that it would be incredibly memorable. I do. I think it would be every time you walk into the church and see that arrow, because the arrow would stay there for a while, because you know Doug would be like, oh. He'd just be thinking, how do I get that, right? And it would take him a long time to actually retrieve it. <clears throat> so it would be there a long time, and every time you came into the, the church, you would remember, oh yeah, that was the Sunday when. And so part of me wonders and, and, and thinks, hey, is this worth doing? Because maybe it could make an eternal impact. Now, I just heard what I said. I don't really believe that uh, a physical arrow can make a, an eternal impact. I'm not going to shoot physical arrows today. I want to shoot spiritual arrows. And spiritual arrows are real. Although you can't see them, they're as real as the walls that you put up that we can't see, but we can clearly feel. I'm not tempted to pull this back and to aim it at any of you. Well, maybe a little tempted. <laughs> but if I were to pull this back and aim it at you, would you feel safe? <laughs> the safety is on. Whatever that means. They have a safety. I had one put on. The truth is, I believe that all of you are within range today of the physical arrow. And so if I were to aim it at you, it would probably be a natural response for you to feel safe and feel somewhat defensive and want to protect yourself. Today, God wants to release spiritual arrows. And although there's, all of you here are in range of the physical arrows, I believe some of you aren't in range of his spiritual arrows. That simply means that there's some of you here who are so walled, so guarded, so heavily protected that you can't even hear God's knock and the arrows that he is shooting just bounce off the wall. I want to assure you today that I am fully persuaded that God has spiritual arrows with every single one of your names on it. They're not arrows of judgment or condemnation. They are arrows of his love and his kindness and his goodness. In order for you to receive, I believe, his arrows, you're going to have to feel safe enough. Or you're just going to have to feel and just trust that, that this is a safe enough place. I want to let you know that I'm going to, to speak today in a different way than I've ever spoken you won't probably notice the difference, but I want to tell you what the difference is. I understand that when you speak, it's really important to speak clearly so that people can have an understanding and grasp certain things. So typically, 
I focus a lot on the delivery of information so that the information is clear. But today, I'm not going to focus on the delivery of information. Today isn't about information, it is about an invitation. An invitation to each one of you, not to let all your walls down because that's unrealistic, but the invitation is for you just to open the window a crack, maybe just to open the peephole, maybe just to take out one brick. The invitation for you is would you allow enough room in your walls and in your defenses for God's spiritual arrow to get through? The one with your name on it. Today I want to talk to you about an aspect of faith, a particular part of faith, a part they consider the core meaning of faith. Today what I'm about to tell you has the potential to change your life. It's not my words but the spiritual arrow that has your name on it, if it's able to land and to hit the mark, it has the potential to change your life. I want you to think back of a time when God seemed to communicate to you so clearly that either immediately or eventually you were fully persuaded that he was speaking to you and what he was saying was absolutely true. Over the course of my life, there's been, uh, I've experienced both. God has spoken to me and immediately I knew he was speaking and immediately I was fully persuaded that what he was saying was true. There's also been other times when God has spoke and I've wondered and I've questioned, is that really you, God? And gradually and eventually, I moved to becoming fully persuaded that God, yes, indeed, was speaking, and he, what he was saying was 100% absolutely true. This morning, I want to start by telling you a story where God communicated to me so clearly and immediately. I was persuaded that he was speaking and that what he was saying was going to happen. It's a story of how I met my first wife. <laughs> and honestly, lots of you guys don't know, but I want to be honest. Uh, I was married before the year 2000 to that woman, my first wife. Now, some of you know this story. Some of you have heard it. Some of you have no idea. But just to give you a bit of context, I grew up playing hockey, and it's a game that I was really good at. I was often the captain of the team, uh, uh, league leader in points, and all of those things led me to believe I was valuable. At the rink, I felt wanted, confident, and secure. But when I left the rink, I had no idea who I was, and I hated how that felt. Feeling lost outside the rink didn't feel good, and that feeling didn't last very long because I wouldn't let it. I immediately went and found another source, an external source to tell me who I was, to let me know that I was valuable, significant, and important. That source ended up being girls. At the rink, I knew I was valuable because I was good and my stats backed me up. And away from the rink, the only way I knew I was valuable is if a girl was interested in me. And really, it was more than that. The game that I played was really to wait to see if it was safe enough to come out of hiding. I needed someone to like me or approve of me or be interested in me before I could come out and actually engage. But then when I did come out and actually engage, it wasn't really me. It was just me doing whatever I thought they wanted me to be. It's a crazy way to live. 
and this is how I lived my life until I was 18. And it was really all a game to me. At the rink, the game was already set up, and I played it well. Off the ice, the game I created was simple. Only move towards people and girls that were interested in me or I knew already liked me because that would mean it's safe enough and I'm valuable. To me, life was simple. Only play games I know I can win. So is there a moment in your life that you will never forget? Is there a moment in your life where you can look back and recall every detail because somehow everything around you slowed down and came into such sharp focus to help you see something you had been missing for your entire life? That moment happened to me in May 1994 when I was 18. It was a normal spring day, sun was out, And I remember I was walking to my car. It was an 83 Mercury Zephyr. It was yellow. It would not have been a car on Jim Topley's list. (laughs) But I was walking towards my car. And I remember I stopped in the middle of (laughs) of the driveway and I looked to heaven and I cried out in a loud voice, I am so tired of playing these high school games. Would you please bring me somebody I don't have to play these games with? And honestly, I was shocked. I knew that I had spoken. I actually looked around to see if anybody heard me because I knew I spoke, I heard the words, but I had no idea where they came from. But immediately I was fully persuaded that I had just connected with God. I knew that he had heard me, that I had spoke, and I also knew somehow in that moment I knew that he had initiated and somehow set apart that time where he gave me the grace to stop, and I felt. Somehow he pulled back the walls and the curtain and allowed me to feel how I was really doing, see how I was really doing, and be able to simply express it to him. I honestly thought I loved the games I were playing, but deep down, I hated them and wanted nothing to do with them. Two weeks later, I jumped into my friend's car, and uh, we headed to play pool downtown Edmonton. Now, what's strange is it was on a Sunday night, and every Sunday night, me and my friends would go over to Glimpse. Glimpse was a worship night at Central Baptist in Edmonton, where about three, 400 young adults would hang out and go, and they would worship. And me and my friends would always head over there and uh, just check out the single ladies and then worship Jesus. <laughs> just want to be honest. That's where I was. So we go downtown and we play pool and it's a Sunday night. We get out of the car and we take about five steps and we just stop and I said, John, what are we doing here? Let's go to Glimpse. I'm going to meet my wife tonight. Again, the words came out of my mouth. I had no idea where they were coming from. But in that moment, without hesitation... Both me and John turned around and headed over to the church. You have to understand, he was a pothead, right? So he was like, "Uh, okay. (laughs) Without hesitation, we drove over there. And as we drove over, I was fully persuaded that I was going to meet my wife that night. We pulled up and it was over. People were coming out. John's like, this is stupid. Let's get out of here. And I, I didn't even say anything. I just got out of the car and I started walking towards the church. Walked through the crowd of people and I sat down in the back row and I sat down fully persuaded I was going to find her. I looked to the left, I remember, and there was, there was nobody. And I turned to the right and there she was. She was being piggybacked up the aisle on her friend's back. And I looked at John and I said, that's her, what do I do? <laughs> Getting advice from a pothead. Actually, in a moment, you'll see it. That pot had helped. (laughs) Uh, Anyways, he he looked at me, and he was looking past me, and I turned around, and there was Krista and her friend, and they were ready to gauge, and she just said, hey, me and my friends are going to Maxwell's. You want to come out with me? Without hesitation, I said, well, we're meeting some friends here. Maybe we'll see you over there. (laughs) Still playing the games. Sanctification is a process, Sandy. So we headed over there, 
I remember being so excited that I actually called my mom, and I was like, Mom, I met my wife tonight, and uh, that didn't go well. (laughs) So we arrived at the restaurant and sat down. It was very interesting because it was a long rectangle table. Uh, John ended up sitting at the end, at the head of the table. I sat beside him. Janine, the person, her friend who was uh, giving her piggyback, and then Krista was beside her and the rest of her friends. We're down the, down the table. The first thing I noticed is that uh, Krista was ignoring me. Yeah, she wasn't used to cold responses to warm invites. The next thing I realized is that uh, Janine had a really amazing laugh, and she laughed at everything. And every time she laughed, Krista would lean over and say, what do you say? So the rest of the night basically looked like me pulling out my best stuff, Janine laughing, Krista checking in, and me paying attention to Krista. It was awesome. All you really need to know is that by the end of the night, I walked away with her number. (laughs) A big clap. (laughs) Here's the thing. The rest of the night, like John, I don't remember, once I sat down, I don't remember seeing John for the rest of the night. Although there's a really good chance he's the guy that drove me home. <clears throat> Why I'm thankful for him is Chris, the later confessed, she said, yeah, we were in the habit of going to church and then finding really cute guys and inviting them out. And she said, yeah, uh, John caught my eye. He was really attractive. And the truth is, the guy's blonde hair. He always had this amazing tan and this five o'clock shadow. She said, yeah, I was really attracted to him until he opened his mouth. <laughs> Don't do drugs. <laughs> We dated for seven months. <clears throat> that was on May um, 29, 29th, 1994, and we dated for seven months, and we broke up on January 1st, 1995. During that three and a half years, there were good days, days where I was fully persuaded that what God said was true and this was going to be my wife. I spent some of those years at Briarcrest, and I had, I had uh, Krista's picture on, on the wall, And there were those good days where I'm like, yeah, I believe that I'm going to marry her. You can run, but you can't hide, right? Because I I didn't know where she was, and there was a big part of her that didn't want to talk to me ever again. So there were good days, but there were also hard weeks and hard months where I was hopeless and could not see any possible way of this ever happening. These were dark days where my faith wavered and my heart got hard. My faith, I realized, was far from Abraham's faith. It says in Romans, against all hope, Abraham in hope believed and so became the father of many nations. Just as it has been said, so shall your offspring be. Without weakening in his faith, he faced the fact that his body was as good as dead since he was about a hundred years old and that Sarah's womb was also dead. Yet he did not waver through unbelief regarding the promise of God but was strengthened in his faith and gave glory to God, being fully persuaded that God had the power to do what he had promised. So if you've ever wondered what kind of faith releases God's power, it's the kind of faith that Abraham had. It's the fully persuaded kind. See, faith is the result of God's divine persuasion. If you're sitting here today with faith, the only reason you have faith is because God has successfully persuaded you about something. Faith is belief in action. So if you are here and you take action because of your faith, it is because you have a personal God who's gone out of his way to initiate communication with you and to reveal and to make known to you his heart, his thoughts, his will, and his ways. Faith is the result of of God's divine persuasion. It's the result of God taking the initiative, clearly communicating with you to the point where you are fully persuaded that he's speaking to you and fully persuaded that what he's speaking is true. And this is the core meaning of faith. And this is what we're talking about today. I believe that understanding this can move you from having no faith to having a little bit of faith to having the kind of faith where you're fully persuaded that God indeed is speaking personally to you and what he is saying is true. 
And that's the kind of faith that releases God's power. Now, the kind of faith we're talking about, this faith that causes someone to be fully persuaded, comes from hearing and hearing from the Word of God. That's Bible. That's Romans. See, in the Old Testament, God's command to His people wasn't to obey. It wasn't to do this and don't do that. His command was to hear, O Israel. Hear was the command. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Hearing was the command. Obedience is important, but only if it comes from faith, which always comes from hearing. See, he wants you to to hear him. He wants you to believe and to trust what he's saying is absolutely true. What he's saying about himself and what he's saying about you. Would you assess yourself as being someone who is out of range this morning? Out of range from the specific personal spiritual arrow with your name on it because your walls are so high and so thick. I loved what you said, Elizabeth. You've got to tidy up when I hear that knock on the door. No, you don't. <clears throat> but when you hear the knock today, some of you, probably realistically, aren't at the place where you can open it wide. It's too scary, too unsafe. Lots of you guys have been hurt and there's broken trust and a lot of stuff that makes you feel really unsafe. But when you hear his knock, if you would be willing just to open that peephole or just open the door a crack, even with a little chain on, Jesus will meet you exactly where you're at. He is so good, He is so kind. God wants you to hear him. And then because you hear him and trust what he is saying is true, then you will obey. True faith is belief in action. If you say you believe God is really big but shrink back in fear, then you really do believe he's smaller than he says he is and he's smaller than he actually is. When you look at God's rescue of his people from Egypt, you see him speaking over and over and over. I am the one that rescues you to bring you out only to bring you into a new land. I'm giving you the land. I will go before you. I will be with you. No one will be able to stand against you. The land is yours because I'm giving it to you. The command was to hear. The hard work was to believe, to trust the one who was speaking and to trust that what he was saying was true. And so it's sad because in Hebrews, the author writes that those people had the same message preached to them as we do to us, but they did not combine it with faith. They were not persuaded that God was able to do what he said he was able to do. They didn't believe he was big and strong as he said he was. And because of their unbelief, they did not enter the promised land and they perished in the wilderness. Faith comes from hearing and hearing from the word of God. We at this church believe that God speaks, that he speaks today. We see in scripture that God speaks to us through his creation. He can speak through a still, small voice. He can speak through our heart's desires, divine appointments, spirit-prompted people of God who care enough to rebuke, correct, and exhort, and encourage But the main way he speaks is through the word of God, and that word is expressed in different ways in the Bible. Three ways I just want to point through to is he speaks through the revealed word. That's the logos. That's the person of Jesus Christ. It says, the word became flesh and lived among us. Jesus said, if you see me, you see the Father. He revealed God. We also have the written word, that's the graphe, that's the scripture that has been written down in our Bibles. We believe it is true and inspired without error. And then there's the spoken word, that's the rhema word, 
a spoken word from God to a person by the Holy Spirit. God reveals himself to us through the living word, it's Jesus. He scribes to us through his written word, the scripture, and he speaks to us through his voice, the rhema word. What I want you to hear this morning is that the spiritual arrows with your name on it come from a personal God and are rhema words personal for you. Rhema means to speak a spoken word made by the living voice. His voice is living. He has the words of life. You can hear it through a sermon, a friend, a song, nature, a situation. But I just want to clarify that if God speaks to you in some unique way and you wonder if it's really him, it will always line up with his character and with his written word. So, a rhema word refers to God's dynamic living word that births faith in a person and results in that person being persuaded and eventually fully persuaded about what God has revealed to them. Faith comes from hearing and hearing from the word of God. And I want to now make room for three stories of people who have heard from God, were fully persuaded that he spoke and acted in light of that. I'm going to hear from Christine, Denon, and Krista. Good morning, everyone. Christine, I'm the first. Uh, I have five minutes, so I'm just going to cut to it right away. So I work at Karis Camp as the director of discipleship. And uh, I was given permission by um, the very amazing Darren Duncalf to hire a program director. Um, So the program director would oversee some of the administrational side of running our summer camps and our program. And um, I was like, okay, Jesus. Who do you have in mind for this job? Um, And um, I was praying and pondering and praying and pondering, and I had the sense that it was going to be someone who actually knew the camp already. And I was like, okay, that kind of limits who that is. And um, Chris and I, after uh, we get back from work, we always sit down, we have a cup of coffee, and we talk about our day, and we're like, okay, what's, 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 what's going on? And I was like, Carissa... I need a program director. I have no idea what's going on. And Carissa says, I have someone in mind. And I look at her, and I actually remember pointing and saying, Savannah Price. And Carissa was like, yes. Went out through my day, go to work the next morning. I'm sitting in my office. I've actually totally forgotten this conversation that Carissa and I have had. And Tara Lemna comes up. Uh, she also works at the camp, and she comes to my office, and she says, Christine, I have someone in mind for the program director role. And I remember looking, and I actually remember pointing, and I, and I said, Savannah Price? And she's like, yes. And then I was like, okay, Jesus, you're saying something here. And so I write Savannah an email saying, Savannah, uh, there's a, Jesus has been putting you in my mind and in people's minds about a program director, is that something that you would like to connect with about more information? And um, (laughs) that was in the morning. Um, About four hours later, Savannah personal messages me on Instagram saying, Christine, I hear you're looking for a program director. I would love to get more information about that. And I I messaged her back and I said, "Do do you see my email? And she was like, no, I did not see your email. And I was like, well, now. She's like, I'll go look at that. And so um, she reads it. We, get, we start conversations and all this sort of stuff. And then we, we make a plan to meet on the Friday. And we sit down. We meet. I talk through the job description. I sort of say, what's, what's God doing in her life? And there's this sense that, oh, yeah, I didn't promise in that moment. But I was like, okay, God's, God's speaking in this moment. Um, Savannah after that meeting was like, honestly, I would love to go talk to my mentors and spend some time in prayer for the next two weeks. Would you be available in two weeks to connect back again? And I was like, sure, let's do that. Someone who loves Jesus, who wants to discern what God's saying, I'm like, yes, this is awesome. Um, Two weeks later, we're meeting on a Friday and I 
got up that morning and I had no peace. None. I was like, okay, this is uncomfortable. I was supposed to meet her in the afternoon, in the morning. I'm like, I need to spend time with Jesus about what's going on about this lack of peace. And what was really interesting is Jesus said, I've already told you. (laughs) And what was also really interesting is that morning I had also read the story of Gideon. And for those of you who know the story of Gideon, Gideon was told (laughs) by God to do something and then he kept asking for signs (laughs) that what he said (laughs) was gonna happen. And I remember thinking, Jesus, your timing is so great. And it was interesting because after that meeting, even though I didn't necessarily feel that peace that I normally associate with being fully persuaded, God said, I have, I've, I've told you. And when we had that conversation, it was like, okay, God had been speaking to Savannah that the only reason she wouldn't take that job would be a lack of faith. And I said, okay, um, welcome to the team. <laughs> And what was interesting is afterwards, there was this sense of, I still didn't have peace, but I knew, I love the the language of fully persuaded. I was fully persuaded that even though I didn't feel what was meant to, how I normally usually feel, that God had spoken. And already God has confirmed um, that that choice. And um, when when I think about Sometimes we can put God in a box and how he speaks to us and we assume that it's always gonna be in the same way and it's always gonna feel the same. But I wanna encourage you this morning. I know I'm, oh, sorry, I was had five minutes. (laughs) That God is so much greater and wants to call us upward and onward and often when we're stuck in, in the comfort, we're actually not gonna be taking steps of faith that trusting in him. And I'm gonna hand this off now to Denon because I will just keep talking. Yeah, God is good and he speaks. Good morning everyone, my name's Denon. I moved to Chilliwack just shy of two years ago and there's a bit of a culture shock when I first came here. Where I'm from, we don't have homeless people, we don't see drugs, we don't see the kinds of things that you might see on any given day here. So when I came to Chilliwack, it was very new to me. And as someone seeing it with with fresh eyes, it broke my heart that God's children are living in bondage, in fear, in pain, and don't know where to go. And I thought for the longest time, God, how can I connect with these people? How can I reach these people? And I didn't know what to do. There was one point where I was researching just how it's all working, coming from Vancouver, and what just about the system. And my friend sent me this documentary called Chasing the Dragon. And there was a 22-year-old Jackie Pullinger who gets on a boat waits for God to tell her to get off, and she finds herself in this city in Hong Kong. It was called the darkness. In this city, there was prostitution, there was drugs, there was gangs. It was so bad, everyone literally called it the darkness. And she went to this place with complete faith that God can heal and transform people's lives. He has the power to do it. So every minute of every day, she spent just being led by God. And she tried to speak. She learned a few uh, words in Cantonese, and she would say, Jesus loves you. And people would look at her with confusion. And she learned that she doesn't have to say Jesus loves you. She had to become Jesus to these people. So I had uh, an experience, actually, early January of this year, Church was finished, and I walked outside to the back to my car, and there I saw two homeless people sitting at the back of our church. And I walk by, I say, good morning. They say, good morning. And I walk to my car, and I open the door, and I freeze. I close the door, I turn around, and I go back up to them, 
And I say, hey, do you want to see something really cool? And the man said, sure. I said, do you have any pain in your body? And the guy said, yeah, I have lower back pain. And I said, you got to see this. Can I pray for you? And he says, sure. So I go up to him, and I pray for him. I say, in Jesus' name, back be completely healed. And I pray a little bit, and I ask him, honestly, how does it feel? And he says, the pain's gone. There's no pain in my back. Praise God. And so I start talking to this guy, learning more about his story, where he came from, how he got where he is, and he expressed that he wants to be free from this. And after talking to him, I ask if he would like Jesus in his life and to be equipped with the Holy Spirit to help him break free. And he says yes. So right here in the back of our church, I got to pray for this man who's so hungry for God. And he gave his life to Jesus. I led him to the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And this man began praying in tongues with me. Now, I've seen him again. He's still in bondage, but he's equipped to this day with the Holy Spirit. And then last week, I get to church. I'm a little bit late, and I'm walking by. I see two more homeless people in the back in the same spot. And I thought, oh, I'll just walk by them on my way and say good morning. I walk by, say good morning, they say good morning, and I do a double take. It was my friend who had recently relapsed. And I went back and I started talking to him, just like the old days, that when he wasn't where he is today. How are you doing? What's going on? Just, just chatting with him. And he was there with another young woman. And it was, it was just so sad to see this taking over their lives. So I, I asked to get to know her. I said, what's your story? And she said, oh, it's so long, maybe another time over coffee. I said, okay, well, let's, let's do it right now. So instead of going to church, I ended up going to Tim Hortons, got some coffee, got some food, came back, pulled an old jacket out of my car, and I sat down with them. And I had coffee, and we ate. And I shared my story, and I got very vulnerable with them. And she shared what is the most heartbreaking story that I have ever heard, and I've listened to a lot. I've heard a lot. Absolutely heartbreaking. I asked if she wants Jesus in her life. And she wasn't sure. She wasn't sure. And God actually showed me something about her, that there's two paths that she can take. And one is a guaranteed freedom. It was light. It was bright. I saw her changing people's lives and even saving people's lives. And this other path, if she continues now, she would literally physically die. How do I give this word to this lady? That's a very tough word to give. But I had to explain it because that's what God showed me. And she said, oh my gosh, I've felt like my death is coming very soon. I just told my friend that. And long story short, I got to pray with both of them. They experienced the love of God. But when I pray for these people or when I have prayed for these people, I pray absolutely convinced that God is who he says he is, that he does what he says he does, and he can actually heal and deliver anyone, anyone from anything, including the people that we see every single day. Thank you. This is good, hey? It's, it's okay, Marty, if we go a little bit over. He's, he's nervous over here, I'm just letting him know. Let's all give him permission to go a little bit over. Um, a really cool piece of Christine's story is I had just earlier that week said to Marty, um, whatever happened to Savannah? I was fully persuaded that she was gonna be a central part of what's happening at camp. And she's just not there. And then I had breakfast with Christine, and she's like, yeah. I'm like, oh, my gosh. That's very cool. Thank you, Jesus. Um, sometimes when God uh, speaks, it's at very inconvenient times when we have 
too much going on already and we're not really interested in listening. <laughs> Anyone ever had that experience? Um, I was running around, I had appointments, I had to grab groceries and get home and make dinner for my family and I heard God say, go for coffee with Tara. Now as much as I like Tara, I didn't want to go for coffee with her. I had just seen her recently and I didn't understand why I would mess up my whole day and go and do that. So I went into one of my appointments, came back out and heard it again very clearly, go for coffee with Tara. So I was like, oh, honestly, Jesus, like, what are you doing? So I text Tara really quick, um, continue on with my errands. I'm like, as if she's even available. Yeah, I just got off work. I'd love to go to Smoking Gun. Yeah, of course you would. Okay. <laughs> it was actually not when I heard God's voice. It was when Tara confirmed the timing was perfect and she was only a few minutes away that I was fully persuaded that God was about to do something. So we go to Smoking Gun, we grab our coffee, and I'm leaning into my conversation with Tara, wondering, okay, God, what does she need? What are you doing? How can I participate? And I notice behind her that there's a lady um, with a stack of cultish kind of books and tarot cards, and she's sitting there with her coffee and alone and looking through some of this stuff. And I said, oh, Tara, um, there's someone behind you. Can we just pray together? And so we start praying for her um, just together at our, our table. And God spoke to me, uh, that lady's having really bad nightmares. Um, I want you to pray for her. So God knew when he asked me to invite Tara for coffee, she's up for a spiritual adventure at her own coffee shop. And that's the coffee shop she would choose because it's her favorite. God also knew when I was on the other side of town at an appointment, that this lady was sitting at the coffee shop. He created this divine appointment of the three of us coming together. And as I was obedient to letting my day be interrupted, I like things organized and I had my day organized. This was an interruption. Um, I sat there and had coffee with her. So as the lady was packing up her books, um, I just said, hey, excuse me, um, can I talk to you for a minute? And she's like, yeah. And I said, I'm a follower of Jesus, and I feel like he just told me something about you. May I share it? She said, yeah. I said, are you having really bad dreams? And her eyes got wide, and she said, yeah. Every night at 3 in the morning, I'm woken up with dark, disturbing dreams. And I said, well, I feel like Jesus has revealed that to me, and I would love to pray for you. Are you open to that? And she's like, yeah. Actually, this morning in my meditation, not to Jesus, um, I was convinced that I was going to meet someone who was going to change my life today. So I was like, whoa, you're so open. This is awesome. <laughs> so right there in Smoking Gun Coffee Shop, we lay hands on her and we pray. And um, we had this huge conversation and I shared the gospel like full on saying, Jesus is the only way, the only truth, the only life. He is the only way to the Father. That's the only way you're getting to him. She had heard these things before, but she began, be, she began being convinced that what she was in was darkness and that God was calling her back to the light. We exchanged phone numbers and we've continued texting. Um, and in that relationship, God has continued giving me words for her. And they have been at the exact moment that she's been in hopelessness and needed exactly the song or the scripture or something I've sent, she is convinced that light is coming into her life and she's moving more and more towards it every day. It's a process, like Denon said, there's a lot of strongholds out there. Our job, I heard this week, is not to cure, it's to care. And like Marty is saying, our job is to listen and trust and obey and the results are left up to our amazing Heavenly Father who is orchestrating stuff all the time if we'll just listen and obey. Thanks, guys. That's awesome. <clears throat> yeah, let's just honestly, Christine, thank you. Thank you for walking in faith and sharing that today. Denon, walking in faith, sharing that. And Krista, walking in faith and sharing. Thank you for hearing and believing and acting in light of it. It's so encouraging. It really is. If you've ever wondered what kind of faith releases God's power, it's the kind of faith that Abraham had. It's the fully persuaded kind. Abraham received God's word and was fully persuaded that he had the power to accomplish what God had promised. 
regardless of how the circumstances looked. So in closing, I just want to show you a scripture in the New Testament that makes it crystal clear that the kind of faith that releases God's power is the fully persuaded kind. This comes from Beth Moore in her book, Believing God. It gives a great explanation to a key distinction I'd like to lay out for you. This distinction is with the word believe, and we're going to look at two different verses. Ephesians 1.13 and Ephesians 1, I believe it's 18. <clears throat> and you were also included in Christ when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. Having believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit. 18, I pray also that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints and his incomparably great power for us who believe. That power is like the working of his mighty strength which he exerted in Christ when he raised him from the dead. <clears throat> now the NIV uses two important and distinctive verb tenses of the same basic word believe in verse 13 and in verse 19. Verse 13 speaks of Christians who, having believed, and this faith action refers to the exercise of the belief that leads to salvation. Each of us who are Christians have heard the gospel and at some point have chosen to believe it and receive it. Most of you here, maybe not all, but have at one point believed God. Because you exercise this faith action, you can immediately know that you become Christ's. We're given his Holy Spirit and marked with a seal. This faith action was exercised in the past with obvious radical results. But the Greek verb tense of the word believe in verse 19 is called a present active participle. And a Greek instructor would explain it this way. When you see a present active participle, Greek verb, you can think of the word continually preceding the verb. In other words, the promise in 19 and 20 is not applied to those having believed in verse 13. Rather, it is applied, applied to those who are presently, actively, and yes, continually believing God. Our glorious walk with God began with an act of faith that brought us into a relationship with Jesus Christ our Savior, but it doesn't end there. Having believed in Christ, we've been called to continue believing all that he came to do and all that he came to say. I want you to hear this. In verse 13, if you have believed, then you have the Holy Spirit and you are marked with him. Take great comfort in that. But remember this. Just because you have the Holy Spirit doesn't mean you have his incomparably great power working for you. No, that is re reserved for those who, in verse 19, continue believing, who are fully persuaded that what God says is true, is true even when they can't see it. I want to welcome up the, uh, the worship team. And as they come up, they're going to play some instrumental. And as they do, I'm just going to finish by reading a story that was sent to me that inspired me. And I think it's really fitting for, for today. Story time. This is an excerpt from Chop Wood, Carry Water by Joshua Medcalf. Chapter 20. Now, has anyone ever told you the story of bamboo, John? He pointed to the towering grove of bamboo trees with their thick green trunks and whispering leaves. John said, no, sir. Well then, John, you're in for a treat. You see, many people love bamboo. They love the bamboo trees and they love the bamboo wood but very few people understand the process of growing bamboo. What you need to do is dig up the soil and make sure that it's good soil. And then you plant the bamboo seed. Then you must faithfully water it every day. And after three months, guess what starts to happen, John? John said excitingly, well, the bamboo tree starts to sprout out, out, out of the ground. Nope. Nothing. 
You see absolutely nothing. And you got to keep watering it and watering it. But you can continue to see nothing happening for one year, then two years, and then three years. And then do you know what happens after three years, John? John replied more tentatively this time. The bamboo tree starts to sprout out of the ground. Nothing. No, you see absolutely nothing. John shook his head. I don't understand. What you don't see happening is what's taking place beneath the surface. See, beneath the surface, a massive, dense foundation of roots is spreading out throughout the entire ground to prepare for the rapid growth that the bamboo will experience. So you keep watering it and watering it. And eventually, after five years of seeing nothing at all happen above the surface, the bamboo tree shoots up over 90 feet tall in just six weeks. You see, John, most people want the 90-foot bamboo tree without the five years of the process. They want the bamboo to grow 90 feet tall in six weeks, but without the five years of invisible growth. But if that were to happen, the bamboo wouldn't have a solid foundation and it could never sustain the massive and rapid growth that is about to, about to occur. Worship team will just continue to play. And they'll play a final song. And I just want you to consider yeah, what you've heard today and where God is specifically trying to connect with you at.